The Grossman model is a foundational concept in health economics, viewing health as a form of capital we all invest in to gain more healthy and productive time. This investment includes activities such as purchasing healthcare, maintaining a healthy diet, exercising, and other behaviors that build a health stock, ultimately leading to more healthy days. The Grossman model is often explained with heavy use of advanced calculus, but today we'll skip the math. Instead, I'll walk you through a visual primer covering the basic model, as well as three scenarios that illustrate how different factors change the outcomes of the model. At its core, the Grossman model can be broken down into four quadrants. Starting from the top right corner, the first quadrant reflects an individual's consumption possibilities, trading of health status and consumption. Moving on to the left, the second quadrant depicts the production function, which shows the relationship between buying health inputs and generating health. Going down, we have the budget constraint visualized in the third quadrant, located in the bottom left corner of our graph. To the right of the budget constraint, we have a helper quadrant, in which we can draw a 45 degree line to complete the four components of the Grossman model. One thing you may notice is that our X and Y axes have three labels. Consumption, which shows up twice on our plot, health inputs and health. This is a little odd given that X and Y plots usually only have two labels, one for the X axis and one for the Y axis. You'll see why this is a feature in a minute, but let's start by looking at each quadrant more closely to better understand the framework. In quadrant one, we can move along the consumption possibility curve, which acts as a consumption boundary. Think of consumption as a composite outcome, so all the things you could possibly consume, while health is an outcome that reflects how healthy you are. For example, if you would decide to maximize consumption and completely ignore your health, you would be on this point on the consumption possibility curve, where it crosses the x-axis. If instead you decide to maximize your health and spend zero money on non-health related consumption, you'd be on this point on the curve, which crosses the y-axis. Ignoring these two unrealistic extreme scenarios, you may wonder how healthy should I be? To answer this, we need to introduce isoquants. Isoquants show a combination of two inputs that produce the same level of health stock. For example, these two inputs could be eating healthy and doing physical exercise. Regardless of which combination of eating healthy and exercising we choose, we produce the same level of health stock. That's why isoquants are also referred to as the indifference curves, given that all possible combinations of eating healthy and exercising produce the same amount of health stock, so we don't care which of those combinations we pick. However, if we want to move to higher isoquants, like E2 or E3, we will increase our health stock, resulting in better health. Let's overlay these three isoquants with our consumption possibility curve to answer the question how healthy we should be. As you can see, we've got three indifference curves plotted in quadrant one. The optimal trade-off between health and consumption is point A, as it gives us the highest indifference curves possible under the consumption frontier. We can't go beyond our frontier and pick a point on E3, and it would not be optimal to pick a point left to our frontier on E1, as we want to get as much health and consumption as possible. That's why point A, where the indifference curve E2 is tangent to the frontier, is the optimal solution. Now that we've answered the question of how healthy we want to be, we can move on to quadrant two and ask how many health inputs we should buy. If we draw a horizontal line from point A, we arrive at this point on the production frontier. From here, we drop down vertically until we hit the point of intersection for our health inputs. This gives us the corresponding quantity of health inputs we need to buy to achieve our desired level of health. You can see that the production function exhibits diminishing returns, whereby each additional unit of health input leads to a smaller increase in health. Think of buying health inputs as anything you may do to produce health. So for example, paying for medical care or spending money on health-related goods or services. Since we know how many health inputs we need to buy, we can follow a vertical line down until we hit the budget constraint line. The budget constraint line acts as a consumption boundary, visualizing how we value buying health inputs in favor of spending money on consumption. In this context, the slope of the budget constraint is related to the price of a unit of health input. This means it tells us how much money we have left to spend on consumption after we bought our health inputs. It's like asking how much our health inputs will cost which is a good reminder for how the third quadrant works. From our point on the budget line, we can make another turn to the right, which brings us into quadrant four. Quadrant four thereby acts as a two-way mirror. 
As you can see, any point on the vertical axis of consumption hits the 45 degree line and reflects up the horizontal axis of consumption. Following this logic for our example, we can create a box shape like this, which represents the equilibrium of our model. Our equilibrium lies within the limit of our model capacity, which we can visualize using dotted lines like this. These limits show the different configurations of our model, including one in which we produce as much health as we can by maximizing the number of health inputs we purchase, as well as another where we maximize consumption. They also reflect any possible configuration in between those two extreme cases, including our equilibrium. Let's look at three scenarios which alter this equilibrium to get more familiar with the Grossman model. First, let's suppose that you experience an income reduction. Maybe you took a job that you like more, but that has worse pay. As a consequence, you can afford less health and consumption, which means that you move from point A to point A prime, as this is the best indifference curve you can achieve now. Moving into quadrant two, the production function remains the same. After all, the relationship of producing health by buying health inputs hasn't changed. However, due to our lower income and consequently lower health, you hit a lower point on the production function compared to before. This means you're now buying fewer health inputs, but you also have a lower level of health. Before we draw our line further, we also need to change the budget constraint, which shifts to the right as a result of our income reduction. Using our updated budget constraint line, we can complete connecting the dots in the four quadrants, showing that an income reduction leads to worse health outcomes, lower consumption and buying of fewer health inputs, as depicted by the A prime rectangle. In our second scenario, let's look at what happens when we lower the prices for health inputs. As you may suspect, a change to the price we pay for health inputs affects the budget constraint line. More specifically, lower prices cause the budget line to rotate outward, with the consumption possibility curve rotating outward as well. Due to the lower prices, we can now buy more health inputs, allowing us to achieve better health while keeping the consumption the same. We can translate this into practical terms, whereby health policies that subsidize health inputs, such as offering free vaccination programs, may lead to better health outcomes for the people who benefit from set subsidies. You may also come up with a scenario in which the technology we use to produce health suddenly gets better, allowing us to produce more health with fewer health inputs. We can think of AI as a great example for this, speculating that it changes our production function in quadrant two. If we assume that AI makes the production of health more efficient, while keeping the price for one unit of health input the same, our production curve will move up. Simultaneously, our consumption possibility curve will go up as well, causing individuals to have higher levels of health while using fewer health inputs. In essence, this scenario shows how we're getting better at producing health, which we can also achieve by improving education levels. This exemplifies another practical implication of the Grossman model, demonstrating how higher levels of education reduce the demand for health inputs implying that injustice in education is likely linked to injustice in healthcare. It's insight like these that make the Grossman model so influential in health economics by framing health as a form of capital that people invest in and manage over time. It helps explain a wide range of behaviors and disparities in health outcomes. If you want to keep exploring topics like this, then go check out one of my other videos, which you can see on screen right now.